Now, we've talked about agency, and if you remember, I told you there are seven ways to cancel agency. Let me make sure I get in there, right? Well, since this form is what creates the agencies, guess how many ways there are to cancel this form? It's virtually the same concept. If you fulfill the purpose, i.e., you closed the property, you sold it, and you closed on it. All of these others apply. You've got the expiration. A listing cannot have a perpetual listing. You cannot have it self-renew. So your listing agreement starts on one day, January the 1st, and ends on June the 30th. Now, there's no standard, and your broker is going to tell you whatever number. All right, we touched on that. But whatever it is, there has to be a definite listing time frame, and it cannot automatically renew. It can't be like you think of those month-to-month -month leases where they just renew every month. You cannot do that in a listing. It has to have a definite beginning and a definite end. Now, if you haven't found a buyer, by the time you get to the end, you can always extend it longer, or you could write a new listing, but it can't automatically renew, all right? If the property gets destroyed, and I told you my example of the house that burnt because it got hit by lightning, and all of those other things apply. Mutual agreement, death of either party. Remember, all mine, so it's the death of the managing broker or the seller, not you. Or there is a breach of the contract. Now, if there's a breach, there could be a court suit which could make one party liable. We're not going to get real deep into this, but we are going to talk about it a little later. If the seller just says, hey, I've decided I don't want to do it, he may be in breach of the contract. Now, we've touched on this. It has to have a definite expiration time frame. There cannot be automatic extensions that automatically renew it, okay? Those are not allowed. Now, inside of this time frame, there is this really special thing called a broker protection clause. A broker protection clause. So what a broker protection clause is, is this. Let's clear this out. Once again, you know I love to go through examples to kind of use stuff to explain it. So a broker protection clause protects the broker, which is me, for some period of time after the expiration date to protect any client that would have been mine during the listing after that time frame, all right? So in the listing agreement itself, there is a blank, and it says something like blank days. Once again, your broker, who makes all of the decisions, is going to tell you, hey, I want you to write 10 days into this because that's what I want, 10 days. So what this is saying Anybody that would have been my client during the listing is still my client up to 10 days after the expiration date. I still get credit for them because they dilly-dallied along and didn't write their offer until after it expired, and I am protected for 10 days or seven days, or 30 days, or 1.8 million days. Doesn't matter. So let's say you have an open house on Sunday. You have an open house on Sunday. A client, or a customer at this point, technically, a person walks in and says, hey, I want to look at the open house. And you say, as a very professional real estate agent, are you working with another broker? And that buyer or potential buyer says, no, I have just started. I haven't called anybody, haven't talked to anybody. And you say, great. 
let me work with you. I will walk you through this open house. And if you decide to buy, I can be your agent. That would make me what? Limited agent or dual agency. Because I've already got the listing since that's my open house. And now I've got a potential buyer that doesn't have an agent. I'm going to represent him. So I'm going to end up being a limited agent. And I have permission from the seller. When I started the open house, I asked the seller, hey, if there are anybody people come through that don't have an agent, can I represent them? And the seller says, sure, I don't care. Just sell the property. And this buyer comes in and you say, are you working with an agent? And they say, no. And you say, well, you know, I've got this listed. Do you mind that I'm the listing agent on this? And they go, well, no, I agree. So now you would be a limited agent when they write the offer, right? Cool on that. So let's suppose he comes in, he loves the house. And he says, I want to go back and get my wife and come back and look at the property. And you say, great, I'll be here for another hour. And he's like, I'm going to run right home, get my wife, we'll be right back. Well, he never shows up. All right. So Monday rolls along and your listing expired. That was the date it was due to expire. Tuesday, this is Tuesday, this is Monday. This guy walks into my office and says, hey man, I'm sorry, I went home to get my wife and the Colts were on TV or Tampa Bay was on TV uh, and uh, we forgot all about it. But I am here today and I have cash in my pocket to buy this property, this guy would fall under the broker protection clause because if he would have bought that day, he would have been my client and the broker protection clause says for anybody that would have been my client for 10 days is still my client because they are protected. So now what you do is you call your guy that listed the house and say, hey man, I know my contract expired yesterday. Are you still wanting to sell? And they say, yes. Great. I have got the buyer right here. And they go, well, I guess I don't have to pay you a commission because uh, the listing expired. No, 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 contraire. I still get the listing because of this broker protection clause that says he's protected. Now, jump over here real quick. Let's suppose there's some third-party guy that just walks in on Tuesday, walks into my office Tuesday and said, hey, I was going to come Sunday, but I was watching the Miami Dolphins game, so I didn't make it in, but I'm here now. This guy's not protected. Understand that because he never came to me during the valid listing. He came to me after the property is expired. He would not be protected under the broker protection clause. This guy is protected. So I call the seller and say, hey, do you want to sell? And he says, yes, I, I still do. And great. I now am going to have him write an offer. You're going to accept the offer and I'm going to be a limited agent or a me, me deal because I've still got the listing ability because of this protection and the buyer does not have another agent. He's mine. Okay. That is what the broker protection clause says. Now, here is a problem with the broker protection clause. You could call them on Tuesday and say, hey, do you still want to sell? I've got a buyer sitting in my office. The sellers could say, no, we don't want to sell any longer. We found out this morning 
that my husband's job transfer fell through, which was the whole reason we were selling. It appears we don't have to move. So no, we are not going to sell. That broker protection clause doesn't matter because they're now not sellers any longer. All right. You still could potentially have this guy and go, hey, uh, I could still help you find another house. But the broker protection clause doesn't hold up because they are no longer sellers. That's one example. But you still have a buyer. The next example is you call them and they go and you say, do you still want to sell? And they say, yes, we still want to sell. But we just relisted this morning with another broker under an exclusive right to sell, which means he is the only one that gets credit. Once again, this goes out the door. So what I'm telling you is the broker protection clause protects a client that would have been yours for X number of days past the expiration as long as they still want to sell and they haven't relisted it with another agent. The second they relist it, this goes away and the new listing agent will be the listing agent. And now, are you completely hosed? The answer is no, because now what you do is you pay and go, oh, okay, who listed it? Oh, I know that agent. You call that agent and go, hey, dude, you just listed the property at 12 Smith Street. I've got the buyer sitting right here. This is the shortest listing you're ever going to have. All right. So you still may get some benefit. You just no longer get the listing side because it has been relisted. That is the broker protection clause that protects and makes sure that so you don't get cheated out of your commission because somebody just came a day late or two days late. Any questions? Feel free to email me at raymond at realuniversity.com. All right, let's talk about the listing presentation. Now, when it comes to the listing presentation itself, there is uh, an issue here that I really don't believe there are any questions about the presentation because there is no standard presentation on how you go out to a seller and present yourself to be the winning listing agent because most people are going to go, well, I'm going to talk to the agent over here and I want to, whichever one of you can give me the best deal or so they're really not going to be a question on the exam that deals with the presentation because there are multiple ways you could do what they call the one-stop uh, presentation. This is where somebody may be a little forceful and they go to the house, do their presentation, ask them to sign the listing right there and walk out the door with the house listed. There are some people that are a little less pressure and they do a soft sell or a, what they call a two-stop where you go out and make the presentation. You leave the documents and go, hey, I'm going to leave these with you. You read them. I'll come back tomorrow and pick them up and we can talk some more. So there's a whole bunch of different ways when you could do the presentation. However, whatever way you do it, there's still some information that needs to be collected on the listing agreement. Obviously, you're going to need all of the people that are on the title. Is it a husband and wife? Is it partners? Is it one person who owns it in severalty? You are going to get a street address. And then the funny thing is here and the legal description. That's probably going to be given to you by the title company. You are not going to be the one that needs to know. Now, I will tell you, most tax records have a very basic that might say something like lot seven of Modulin Estates. And then the title company will go out and get the Northeast Quadrant and the Northeast Quadrant. But you're still going to obviously write a street address and some basic information there. You're going to get all of that information that we talked about, like the size and the type of the improvements. Think back to what an improvement is. 
Remember, day two, any man-made item. Is there a fence? Are there outbuildings like barns? All that kind of stuff. You are going to get all the, the size of rooms, the three-bedroom, two-bath. You have got to capture all of this information. What's the zoning? Usually residential, since that's what we're doing. Is there any real property that's going to be removed? That would be the severance. And if you think back about the rose bush, where the lady took the rose bush, or is there going to be anything that's going to be left through annexation? All of that stuff would be captured. Is there anything in the house that maybe is under a lease agreement? For us old people, they used to have to lease the dishes for Dish TV. <laughs> okay, probably not so much of that anymore. Water softener may be something else. Hey, maybe it's being rented. You need to collect that information so that the buyer knows they're either going to have to take over that lease or that water softener may leave because it's technically not the owner's property. Then there's going to be disclosures you're going to have to get, like are there any uh, uh, material defects to the property that you know of? Well, yes, there's a cracked foundation, and I think there's a hole in the roof. And any of the other ones that may be required by state or federal law, like lead-based paint and all of that. So all of those information is going to be collected and put on the listing agreement. Now, I know for a fact there is no question on the exam that's going to ask you, name seven things or that are on the listing exam, or pick one of these that would not be on the listing exam. So most of this is fairly basic knowledge, but usually is not tested over, all right? Like you're going to need the names of all the parties. That's what we just talked about. Here's the most common one, the listing price. The listing price has to go on the listing, obviously, right? Now, a listing presentation is typically a planned event. What I mean by that is most sellers will call you and go, hey, Raymond, I want you to list my house. Uh, can you meet me this evening at 5 o'clock when I get off work and I'll sign the paperwork? That is a planned event. I will tell you on the other side of it, when you're dealing with buyers, it is not uncommon to get a phone call with a buyer that says, dude, I want to see a house and I'm sitting in front of it right now. Can you come and meet me and get me in? Yes, let me be right there. So that that's common. On the listing side, very seldom does someone go, hey, I'm walking out the door be right here in five minutes. It's a planned event. So during that time frame, when they call you and they go, can you be here at five? And you go, I got seven hours for me to do something. So you go, okay, I'm going to pull the tax records and verify the name of record just to at least be sure. So that when I call, pull up the tax record and say, oh, well, who's Bob and Bill? And you call back your friend and go, hey, David, who's Bob and Bill Smith? Let me, so you don't go, well, that's not valid. Who's Bob and Bill Smith? And he goes, oh, those were the owners we just bought the house from last week. We bought it, rehabbed it, and now we're reselling it. This is a case of where the owner of record could be wrong. And you go, oh, well, you might have to bring those closing documents so we can prove you own it because the owner of record still Bob and Bill, because there hasn't been a switch yet. So that's one of the things you get to do in this planned time of eight hours. The next one you are going to get to do, which we haven't talked about, is do what's called that comparative market analysis, that CMA, that um, valuation. And when you do that, you will come back with a range of prices. So you will tell the seller, hey, look, I've pulled the comps in the neighborhood for this house, and we're going to get into all that. So don't worry about it at this moment. But for this house, this property should sell for somewhere between $245,000 and $255,000 based on the comps. Where would you start? Where do you want to start listing the property? Do not 
be the person that suggests the value or the list price. 